The appreciator is here. A preach. Theater. No, I'm not preaching. I'm just mispronouncing. Yeah, it's Brett, a.k.a. PQ, once again bringing you the stuff that uh, I like, appreciate, enjoy, um, honor, and uh, otherwise uh, don't feel bad about telling you, yeah, you can go out and check that out. That that, that could be pretty cool because uh, there's a lot of stuff like that. And... Um, yeah, let us just jump right into stuff. Um, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, I know a lot of people are really into those retro games, those early games, the early Nintendo games this time specifically, that original NES system that uh, so many of us older people had played rented games from the video store horrible games but they were you had it so you would sit there and play a game that now you wouldn't spend five minutes on uh, for days trying to figure out even how it works and and they came with these manuals that told you nothing uh, especially the games imported from japan if there was a manual it was like almost totally incoherent and and this this was fun uh i at times i would say more fun than uh, some fancy game on steam that uh just I don't know. But uh, in that line, there is a channel on YouTube. It, it, this fellow started actually posting these shows on archive.org well over 10 years ago. His name, or he calls himself Dr. Sparkle, and uh, he has done, and I've talked about this before on my shows, a series called Cron Tendo. I mean, that's not to mention he's also done similar with the original Sega, Cron Sega, and Turbo Graphics with Cron Turbo. But I never had a Sega, and I certainly couldn't afford a Turbo Graphics. Those were like the um, Rolls Royce, the Porsche, if you will, at least as far as price. Uh, the games, yes, they were closer to those. Uh, video games in the arcades and, and back then really to play a quality video game i mean even in the heyday of the nes if you really wanted to play a game you went to the arcade and uh, got lots of change and pumped a bunch of quarters into machines and that was how it was done because the nintendo while fun was a, a weaker uh processor and now i mean it, it, it takes nothing to run a nintendo game you get these nintendo emulators and the games are these little teeny tiny nothings but you know what there's still quite a lot of fun and uh, that's another thing that uh, well let me tell you what Crontendo is because i've been babbling here and i haven't told you specifically what dr sparkle has done he started way back with the release of the uh, console and from the very first game has been going in chronological order and at present I think he's in the year 1990 I am not if I am not mistaken and every game including the ones that were Japan only he shows you some video of it he tells you how it plays and ranks it and rates it and he also does little specials on what was going on in the arcades at the time it, it really is uh, a well-researched encyclopedic look at the nintendo entertainment system and uh, he is up to gosh uh, i think he just uh, released uh, episode 62 and some of these episodes are two hours or more longer they average in at a little over an hour i'd say and it really is a schooling on these more than classic video games and i would heartily heartily i mean the new one he is up to june 1990 a really big month but 
so many just horrible, horrible games, uh, the, which are, I guess, known to the wise ones as shovelware because they're just shoveling them out there and just terrible terrible games and kudos to dr sparkle i mean he's uh gone through some really dry periods and very productive periods over the years but he keeps coming back and he keeps doing it and i would imagine by june 1990 uh the Super Nintendo was about to come out, and uh, he d- probably doesn't have very much more to go before he completes this daunting. And uh, who'd have thought that he would get through them all? And he hasn't yet, so let's uh, just keep our fingers crossed. Um, another thing that I appreciate that... Uh, Many people don't know about this. Is now we're moving over to food. Many people don't know about this product. This and have never tasted it. And other people have tasted it and don't like it. And uh, it's not really available, at least in any kind of fresh way, in most of the United States. Uh, I think the place where it's most common is uh, south southeastern. Pennsylvania, around Philly, Lancaster. I'm not sure, but uh, I always link it in my mind with uh, the Amish people because when I was a kid, my uh, family would go down there. And one of the things my stepdad would always grab was Scrapple. Have you ever had Scrapple? It's kind of a ground sausage with a little cornmeal, and it's just great. You slice it real thin, and you fry it till it's almost crispy or crispy, and uh, it's good with eggs and cheese. Uh, When I lived in Hatfield, Pennsylvania, back in like 2006, an egg and Scrapple and cheese sandwich was just such a treat because, you know, the it's fresh. I mean, you can get some sort of uh, Jimmy Dean frozen scrapple out here in New Mexico, but it, it's not It's not the same. It just doesn't taste right. And uh, uh, again, this is something, uh, eat at your own risk. I would not say this is a healthy food or some sort of, I'm, I'm Frank Edward Nora, who's a vegan, is probably... Uh, almost certainly never going to have scrapple if he ever has had any and uh, yeah if you're a vegetarian or anything like that just excuse my um philistine music uh musical yeah, well you might uh, think my musical tastes are philistine but the stuff that i eat i mean i'm trying to eat healthier because i'm getting to be an old guy and you can't just keep eating the kind of crap that i eat but uh yeah I'd still have a scrapple, an egg sandwich with a little cheese. I mean, even American cheese. There are certain things that excuse the use of American cheese. I mean, it would, it's not really even cheese by any technical definition. But there's something so... Well, it was the cheese of my youth. So there's something kind of, I don't know, comfort food about American cheese, even though I know it's just absolutely terrible. And while we're on food, uh, I have been doing uh, like these little, uh, I have such a limited uh, cooking capacity here. I've got a toaster oven and a microwave. And uh, nonetheless, I, uh, I doubt I'm the first person to do it, but I have been taking hot dogs. Uh, usually I get Nathan's all beef, because, I don't know, it reminds me of when I was a kid and going to places like Coney Island and getting a Nathan's hot dog. And no, it's not the same because I don't steam them. But a Nathan's hot dog and you get some prosciutto, which is, uh, if you're not familiar, a uh, Italian cold cut. It's kind of a ham, but kind of saltier and cut very, very, very thin. Uh, it, it, you should check it out prosciutto is what it's called and i have been wrapping hot dogs in prosciutto and then a little uh usually i use a dijon mustard although technically the spicy brown mustard i think is your traditional hot dog mustard on a bun and just 
deliciousness. In in general, uh, I'm rediscovering prosciutto, and it's, it's a wonderful cold cut. Again, it's a little salty, but I don't know. Uh, that salt may not be good for me, but some things are just awesome as salt. And uh, continuing the appreciation, um, this is a longer clip than I like to use on the show, but uh, the man who inspired this whole overnight scape underground thing in the first place was named Gene Shepard. And he did uh, about an hour long radio show weeknights, uh, did a special thing Saturday nights live from the limelight in New York, and he was a raconteur, which is sort of a word for storytellers, but it implies that the story has been, has stuff added to it, what they call gilding the lily. Even if it's a great story, adding a little more to it makes it special. And uh, he was Frank Edward Nora's inspiration for doing the Overnightscape. Uh, I discovered him around the year 2000, and he definitely, I, I would love to have that talent he had. And uh, here is a sample from one of his shows in 1965 so you too can get the Gene Shepherd feel. We had this, uh, you probably have, uh, get these things too, where they come around, the local uh, merchants, uh, the, the local stores, throw away these throwaways of the ads of, uh, of big sales, food ads, food sales, and a big uh, post-Christmas sales big uh, New Year's Day turkey sales and all that stuff. Well, I go struggling out to the porch to get the mail in the middle of this howling gale. And I come struggling back, and with me is this, uh, this, this flyer. And it's, it's for a store that was about two and a half miles away from our house. Way down, I mean about two and a half, maybe three miles away, uh, in the next town, as a matter of fact. And I, I'm looking through this thing just sitting there, and they had an ad in there, a bushel of apples for 45 cents. Now, I remember it distinctly, the price of everything. Now, don't ask me why a bushel of apples for 45 cents, but it was a bushel of apples. It said a special Christmas sale on winter apples, 45 cents a bushel. So I'm thinking about this. And my kid brother is under the day bed. He's weak, you know, he's yelling and hollering and whimpering. And I drag him out and uh, I put on my earmuffs and I tell him to get on his helmet with the goggles. And I put on my high tops and we go out into the snow and next door at the Bruner's house. And I get Bruner out and the Bruner and myself, my kid brother, and at about 15 minutes, Flick, all standing in the driveway, up to our eyebrows in frozen, rotten, cruddy, dirty, blast furnace snow. The temperature is seven below zero. And I say, let's surprise our mothers. Let's go and get a bushel of apples for 45 cents. Well, I had a dollar that had been given to me by my Uncle Tom for a Christmas gift. And so I figured I would, what a fantastic surprise, to bring home a bushel of apples. Now, don't ask me why. I know it's a silly question, a silly thing to do. Don't ask me why. And so my kid brother, eh, and the flick says, well, how do we get there? And the donor says, how do you expect to get over there? And this was a place that was the IGA store. Do you ever hear the IGA uh, chain stores? Well, the IGA store was a good two miles away. It was in the next town. And I said, we'll take our sleds. Well, we started. We were fighting against the raging gale. It was about one o'clock in the afternoon. And we began along that twisting, evil, ice-encrusted, how emblazoned, yes, Finlandia. I'll announce very loudly. You don't play Tiger Rag when you're fighting the gale, Dad. Anyways, I'm glad you asked me. Well, uh, I can understand why Sibelius wrote the way Sibelius wrote. This is the sound of the frozen north, friends. 
Yes, indeed. Well, after two and a half hours, we had gone maybe one half a mile. Just far enough not to turn back, and just far enough to know we might never make it. The wind howled and it howled, and my kid brother was hanging on to the back of my sheepskin coat. Bruner was limping badly. Flick's nose was running all the way down to his knees, and I said, "Forward!" The madness was on me. Well, we fought the howling winter gale for, I would say, a good. Five hours, and I mean five hours.、Uh, have you ever had frostbitten ears? Well, I have had frostbitten ears. I got them that afternoon. My kid brother had a frostbitten head.、Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you. Before we got there, Bruner was frozen solid. We had him lashed to the sled, and and Flick, believe me. Was a sled himself. We were just pulling him along. He had runners sticking out of his ears, and we finally arrived at the IGA store. I'll never forget this. We were unable to walk. We were just walking it like like stiff with with ice all over our ears. And we came out of this howling gale, and there was the IGA store. At long last, it I, I, it must have been the way、uh, Ahab felt when he saw that big white fluke come out of that water. And I took one look at the IGA store, and I says, "Here we are." It was closed. Closed. Speaking of tragedy, this is W O R A M and F M New York.、Uh, we we arrived at the IGA store, and、uh, we stood there. We got there. It must have been a half an hour after the IGA store had closed. I couldn't believe it. You see, because this was my whole bit. This was my stick. Now、uh, this was a hang-up that I had. I was the driving force behind that. And by this time, you know, there's a certain point in, 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 in.、Uh, I suppose you can call it misery. At a certain point in misery, you don't complain anymore. Are you aware of that? You reach, you reach a point beyond which complaining is gone. You just sit there and you freeze or you burn or whatever it is you're doing, and you no longer whimper. You don't say anything about it. And my kid brother was just standing there like a fire plug. He wasn't crying or anything. Flick's nose. It was, just, it was no longer running. It was frozen. It had two long icicles hanging down. And、uh, Bruner was just standing there numbly in a snow drift. I could see his eyes sticking out of the snow. And we stood there in front of the IGA store. <laughs> and you think I gave up? Oh boy! <laughs> I said, "Let's go on to the A and P." Well, you know they weren't running forty-five cent a bushel、uh, sales at the A and P, so the A and P was another four blocks down. So we struggled onto the A and P, and the wind is howling. It's getting dark. Well, we got to the A and P, and it's still open. They stayed open a half an hour longer than the I G A store, and into the A and P we got. Just tremendous heat hit us instantly, and that's when they all started to cry. All three of them started to yell and holler. And I go back to the vegetable department and I said, "Do you have apples for sale?" I said, "Apples? We mean apples? Yeah, there's apples. You know, apples three for a dime and bigger. They had them all." I said, "I want a bushel of apples. A bushel of apples? What do you mean a bushel of apples?" And I took out my ad and I showed it to him. Forty-five cents for a bushel of apples. Well, the manager of this store—I will—I will never forget this because obviously he saw there were four kids with a fantastic hang-up, and he says, "Well, that's the IGA store." I said, "I know, but they're closed." He says, "Bushel of apples for forty-five." I said, "Well, I know what they're talking." He says, "They're talking about those little horse apples, those little—I can see them muttering. It's all horse apples." And he goes down to the basement with two kids, and they came back up with a bushel of apples, and they gave me a bushel of apples for forty-five cents. Now I will never forget. Every time I walk into the A and P now, I get a vaguely warm glow. And and they gave me a bushel of apples for forty-five cents, and all four of us are holding this. Have you ever carried a bushel of apples when you're ten? You know, and you're frozen. And the four of us have got this bushel of apples. 
And, and, and I gave him the dollar, and the guy gave me back the change for, you know, 55 cents. And he says, well, he said, uh, do you want us to deliver him? I said, no, we're going to take him home. He says, in the snow like this? Where do you live? And I told him, he says, I, you, you, you're going to, are you driving? Well, we got our sleds. You've got your, and it's getting dark. It's about six o'clock out there. Now, you know, it would be like two o'clock in the morning by the time we got back with these, with these crummy apples. And, and the manager of the, of the apple department of the A&P says, well, maybe you better call home. It's for a surprise. He says, it's for a surprise for who? For, I'm going to surprise our ma. Yeah, I don't know what to say. Well, do you think you can get better not? And he called somebody over named George. And George came over to the four of us and he says, uh, we'll take you home in a truck. And they had this big hand feature, giant big green truck and all on the side of it. It said Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company with the red and gold letters. And, and uh, he says, come around to the back. And uh, we came around the back, and he says, we're going to take you home. Uh, Mr. Mr. So-and-so has decided that you better go home in the truck, and uh, we'll take you home. Uh, you say you're going home to Hessel? I said, yeah, mm -hmm. Cleveland Street. But the, what about our sleds? Oh, okay, well, let's pick up the sleds. Well, all four of us got in the back of this truck with our three sleds and a bushel of apples, and they turned around and they drove all the way on back. The guy couldn't believe it. We had gone about three, maybe three miles, close to three miles, in probably the most gigantic snowstorm that had hit this town in years. Well, why? I, I don't know. You know. And, and, and so about a block away, I'm knocking on the door. See, I'm knocking on the back window. And he's in the cab. We're sitting in the back. I'm banging on the window. And he stops. He says, is this where you live? And I says, yeah. We're a block away from home, see? And so he says, okay, kids. He says, boy, man, he says, gee whiz, wow, what a night. I don't know how you came this far. And so out we go out the back. And I put the bushel of apples on the sled. And I started to tug. And Flick pushed. And Bruner hung on to the back of my coat. And my kid brother is whimpering in the snow drifts. And we went up to the back porch of the house through a block of blinding blizzard. And my mother came on. I says, Ma, I got a surprise for you. And she says, what have you? Apples, a bushel of apples. How wonderful. Oh, for heaven's sakes, where did you get them? A bushel of apples. I said, we got them. At the IGA store, Ma. She says, a bushel. And then I showed her the ad. I said, see, look, a bushel of apples. We thought we'd surprise you. And now comes the denouement. We had 4,500 apples, all frozen as hard as you couldn't believe. Have you ever tasted an apple that was frozen and then thawed out? The instant those apples thawed out, they all turned into one gigantic pile of brown mush. <laughs> but you know, for, for, for years after that, it was like a big thing in the family. It was like the time that I really went out and did it. And everyone said, well, do you remember the time that Gene went down and got the bushel of apples? Gee whiz. Oh, boy, those were really, that, that was really something. Wasn't that great how they did that? And that really, I mean, it doesn't capture what he was able to do with uh, an hour-long time slot. He would just digress. Uh, first off, he would start off with something just completely almost lunatic, like playing uh, a Jew's harp, or you know, boing, 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 or uh, drumming on his head, or a kazoo to some obscure, weird piece of music. And he said that was to chase away anybody who didn't really belong there. And then he would get into just a monologue of some sort and perhaps tell a story. But generally speaking, at 
the tail end of the show, he would do something that just tied it all together in this nice little package. Uh, he was just a master with words and stories. And they say Garrison Keillor uh, swiped from him. And I tend to think just about everybody who talks into a microphone through that maybe not listening to Gene Shepard, but listening to people who are influenced by Gene Shepard. Uh, he really did leave a legacy of an untold legacy of comedians and people who heard him and implemented him into their work. Even Jerry Seinfeld was a Gene Shepard fan. Um, and even, and even the will they remember Gene Shepard long, longer than Jerry Seinfeld. And they're both JSs. I just realized, huh? Yeah, all these great coincidences that, I don't know, they probably mean nothing, but it's fascinating noticing them. And I've neglected to mention the exit ramp that happened this week that, uh, for those of you unaware, is the Overnight Scape Underground group talk uh, about once a month. Frank Edward Knorr opens up a Zoom room. And no, we don't use the visuals. We just kind of look at each other. Uh, but the audio portion of that Zoom chat with uh, many people, I mean, just this week, uh, uh, we had uh, Michael Fair, Dave in Kentucky, Ian Eric from Norway, Simon out of Nevada, um, Jefferson from the Philadelphia area. I like Jefferson. He's an honorary weasel, uh, even. And I'm not even an honorary weasel. Jay Foreman, Doc Slees, Denise showed up. And uh, I'm sorry, I only got there for the beginning. But uh, Joe Gibson, my buddy in the Chicagoland region, our Illinois fella, uh, was there as well uh for the festivities so um and that unlike this uh that the, the exit ramp is an epic and bulky contrivance uh this last one was four hours and 21 minutes and six seconds of uh gold uh solid gold conversation and uh Every Topic Under the Sun, the title, in case you're uh, in the future somewhere to have this one. This was what? Wow. The 45th exit ramp, and the title was Conestoga Coast, which uh, the potential meaning of uh, is discussed. Uh, that happened while I was there, if I recall correctly. And it, just a great bunch of people both on sug broadcasters and listeners and and you you could participate uh just uh, be be part of the magic uh if you're a facebook person you can uh like the overnight scape underground uh group i think it is i uh, groups and pages and uh, but yeah just like it and that way you get the notifications and the link and yeah, just even if you just sit on the sidelines and listen, uh, it's like amazing live radio. And just like this, there's no like real advertising. I mean, sure, um, if we talk about things and we like them and perhaps suggest you might, but it's none of this hard sell stuff that we are all so inundated with day after day. I mean, nobody can do anything anymore without trying to sell you something or like sign up for my patreon and uh and how much of that patreon money does patreon get for just existing and acting as some sort of go-between i just don't what a world uh this but i can appreciate that they make it easier i mean some people the direct contact is risky in this modern era so i mean it's understandable it's a clean place and it provides some sort of uh protective wrap sort of like a um internet condom just in case and yeah there's a lot of just in cases needed people get 
hacked and whacked and suddenly somebody has all their banking information but no 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 it's, 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 <laughs> you, you want to know how you avoid that don't have a bank but then i mean money is about to disappear uh but that's a whole other thing for another conversation and um yeah, we've got another appreciator in the can, so to speak. Uh, always looking for ideas for topics we can tackle. Uh, your comments are always welcome and appreciated, even if you say, hey, you know, you got to stop doing this, that, or the other thing. Uh, that I'm listening, and uh, we want to make this a better and better uh, place to bring your ears as uh, often as I do it. I mean, we're almost daily, but that's, who knows how long that'll last. Uh, I am an inconsistent person as far as this, uh, as history shows for my um, non-Overnight Scape Central shows. For years, I ran that Overnight Scape Central like a clock somehow. And we're going to, we're getting back to that weekly thing. And speaking of that, uh, we're looking at that same email address. If you send something about the Beatles, I mean, this week we are talking about the Let It Be album. But uh, anything Beatles over the next few weeks will be welcomed because we're going to be talking about that fabulous four at least into uh, probably the beginning of July of 2023. And in the meantime, without further ado, to let you get back to whatever it is you were waiting for me to get done so you could do, set the controls for the heart of the fun. It's a good thing to do. <laughs> 